Hello. In episode 36.2 of AS for Architecture, I speak with Eleanor Jolliffe and Paul Crosby about their very recent book, Architect, The Evolving Story of a Profession, published by Reba Publishing in March this year. Designing and delivering a building is such an endlessly complicated process. You cannot do it as an individual. It's always a meeting of minds. And it's not just architectural minds. You need engineering trained minds and specialist facade people or specialist sustainability people. It depends on the project. But you need a broad range of people, education, specialisms, experience in order to deliver a building. So the collaboration is absolutely key. And I think a lot of the reports from the construction industry in the 90s were pointing that way that actually the increasingly adversarial procurement routes something like that is never going to be good for the building at the end which is what we all claim we're invested in the whole team design construction education everyone needs to work together because it's just too complicated a field for individuals to think they can tackle it by themselves A is for Architecture, a podcast about architecture, buildings, urban culture and space. Hello and welcome to another episode of A is for Architecture. I'm talking today to Paul Crosby and Eleanor Jolliffe. I got that right. You did, yes. Fantastic. Eleanor and Paul, um, uh, thank you so much for joining me. Would you be able to introduce yourself, please? I'm Eleanor, um, so I'm a practicing architect. I work at Alice Morrison, um, and in my spare time, I do writing um, for various periodicals, which is what started uh, the journey of the book for me. All right, well, that's pretty. That's a pretty short introduction. The book, <laughs> we, the book we should mention probably right is, is is Architect: The Evolving Story of a Profession, which you co-authored, um, and it's been published by RIBA Publishing um, this year, wasn't it? Yeah, just a few months ago. Just a few months ago. Um, so, Allies and Morrison, that's a big practice. It is, yeah. Uh, so it's about 300-odd people based in uh, London and Cambridge. Um, we've also got a few people up in Manchester and over in Ireland now as well. But um, but the book and everything I do that's writing is entirely off my own back. So it's it's not speaking on behalf of Allies and Morrison in any way. <laughs> Just to be perfectly yeah, clear. Yeah, yeah, just, dis- <laughs> just to get the disclaimer in, you've got to do that. Yeah. And Paul, and Paul you, you run professional practice at the AA. I, I do, Ambrose, yes. It's um, it's a full-time position running uh, the Part 3 programme mostly, but also the challenge of introducing what we loosely term professional practice to Year 3 students and others in the AA who are willing to join i i also examine on part three courses um at uh, at cardiff the riba um and uh, northumbria and westminster and i'm an external examiner at the at oxford brooks for the apprenticeship program um, fantastic which is which is really good yeah yeah That's a busy and one. have been in what we what we term academia ambrose you know this world for the past five, six years or so, having had a long career of over 30 years. And I, I slightly hesitate to say, say building buildings, but I was certainly in practice. I didn't build very many buildings. And I think such as the lot of being an architect that uh, without stating the obvious too much, it takes a long time to build a building. And many of the projects I worked on either went on hold, we suspended or just didn't ever really happen for some reason. And were you working as a sole practitioner or a sole trader or were you uh, um, running a company? Or No, well, in, in, in a quick summary in chronological order, I, I joined a practice called Fitzroy Robinson uh, many years ago, mid to late 80s, um, in, in, a, in a recession, I hasten to add. One of the few people graduating from PCL who who found a job in architecture and, uh, you know, such is our, our profession that um, it depends on when you join it. I, I Many people were lost. They went off and did other things. They didn't didn't ever come back to the, to the world of design and construction. I then went off to Germany with Fritz Romsen to open up an office in Leipzig uh, for a couple of years. Came back, joined David Chipperfield Architects. was a was a director of uh, of David Chipperfield Architects for ten years. Then joined Zaha in a senior position. Zaha Hadid Architects for two years. And then ventured somewhat outside of architecture, although still within the 
uh, realm of design to join Martha Schwartz and Partners, a landscape architect from America. Mm. And that was a really quite enjoyable experience and, and, and very interesting looking at the profession from the outside in. And our clients were mostly architects. And then, and then became an academic. And then I decided, look, I, this is time for a time for a change. I need to uh, think about uh, mentoring, teaching, and, um, and and had ideas as to professional practice. Really, really good. I and mean, Martha Schwartz is wonderful. I always like her work. L- lurid and outrageous, really, in a way, isn't it? And, yeah, well described. <laughs> um, so, so. Um, that was very comprehensive and really, um, really nice to hear. I, I'm always interested in this very vari- these various routes into and through architecture. And your uh, an earlier point, no offense, Paul, an earlier point in your career. Um, so I was wondering. So this this book that you've written, beautifully illustrated, comprehensively illustrated. Most books I look at on this podcast um, have about three grainy, <laughs> look like they've been photographed, uh, photocopied pictures. But this one is absolutely lovely. Um, we were very lucky, actually. We had access to the RIBA collection, so we had a lot of fun going through the archives. Um, Did you get a special fun- deal? Well, because it's published by the RIBA, they sort of said anything from the archives you like. So, um, And there's all these wonderful photos that I particularly like of sort of these rather stiff groups of men around drawing boards and things in offices from 100 years ago when cameras were quite new and things like that. Yeah, it. I mean, it, it. It. So. So it goes through the book. Goes through, yeah, the story, the the evolving story of a profession. And you start way back when. <laughs> I mean, maybe we can come to that. But what was what was the where did the desire to write the book come from? You as a practitioner, Paul. You as a, <clears throat> I would say, someone who's progressed beyond practice. Obviously, um, <laughs> uh, where do, where does the desire to kind of document this story of the architect come from why this book now um i mentioned earlier i write um so i've been writing a column for building design for about nine ish years now and was looking for a book for something i was writing that explained where architects had come from and sort of realized well the last one in the uk was written in the 1920s um which isn't that helpful and a lot of people at work were talking about this golden era post world war ii which was it had all happened before I was born, sort of 60s and 70s, um, 80s was all before I was born. And I thought, well, okay, where can I find out about this that isn't just asking people? And realised that book didn't exist. And so went to chat to the RIBA um, thought it would be nice to write a book about this, to chart it through so that other people are looking for that. And um, they matched Paul and I up and thought our relative experience and interest would complement each other on the book, but we both felt it was important to chart now, especially with lots of changes at the moment in the profession because of the act, because of the climate crisis, um, because of, we were talking about at the very beginning, because of Brexit, I'm sure there will still be fallout from that. Um, Paul, I don't know if you agree. Um, No, no, completely. I I think it's, it's an area almost accepted. We, we, we use the term, professional we've already used it in this conversation a number of times and one of the things that really interests me is how do how do we define that it's one of the first questions we ask our year three and part three students is what does the word profession mean and with that comes subsidiary secondary questions of well where do we come from you know how do we define professional and professionalism how is it how we act how we behave what we know and so on all those traditional forms of of the nature of determining ourselves as professionals but i think it's important to uh, place ourselves in context i mean history here is so important as to the lineage of where we've come from that might help us, and I'm sure we're going to be talking about this over the next minutes, is to where we are going as much as anything. So the book is, the book, I, I don't think it takes a, a position particularly as it's, it's a, as I think Ellie's used a really good word, charting. I think that's a really good word to use in this case. And um, it's, is that a position now when so much is happening with, with the, uh, um, Let's let's call it the reduced role of the profession, the role of the architect, 
um, Brexit definitely in in contemporary and international European context, climate change, inclusion, and uh, we have we have to talk about this in terms of more detail, in particular as uh, of, of the UK of Grenfell. All of these things have thrown up an enormously interesting context of where we are, where we've been, and where we're going really interesting idea that there's not been a comprehensive kind of a his, uh, documentation of the, of the lineage of architecture, the evolution of this story since the 20s, in a hundred years. I mean, that, I that's, that's sort of telling, isn't it, mm. about the way that architecture is perceives itself, there's so itself, much about, and then is understood by the public. There's so much about architecture, the buildings and the styles. Mm -hmm. There's very little about architects and the people involved. Mm -hmm. And really, this could have gone on for volumes and volumes, this book, because the more we were going, the more we thought, actually, this can't possibly be comprehensive. It's 250-ish pages long, but it gives a glimpse. But also, there's all the other related disciplines and professions that architecture sort of started off encompassing and have slowly specialised up into quantity surveyors and engineers and so on. It's there's so little written about the people that are involved in the processes. We're interested in the finished product, but we seem to have lost an interest in the process. And I think that's really unfortunate. And it also missells what those of us who practice do on a day to day basis, as most of my life is not the finished product. It's getting there. <laughs> yeah. I I mean, so so the book. The book charts this opening out this evolutionary story, and I was wondering if if there was a pot a, a sort of simple way of of describing it because it's it's a it's a movement as you describe it from relative straightforwardness of the relationship of the architect to the building or to the master crafts master builder to the building towards what we have now, which is incredible complexity and the architect taking up a single role within that complex structure and i was wondering if there was some way that you might have of kind of unpack describing that a little bit i mean without wishing to completely repeat the entirety of the book or just read wow. the chapter titles <laughs> um i think in a nutshell, the growing complexity of the profession and the professional arrangements around construction sort of go along with the increasing complexity of building technology. So you mentioned master craftsmen, maybe let's sort of skip all the way to the Middle Ages. Um, you've got the, the architect is the master builder at that point. And they're coming often out of an apprenticeship in stone and they really know the material. Mm -hmm. But as, I mean, if we then skip ahead to say World War One, World War Two, you get huge technological breakthroughs following those wars on building products and building materials and the scale of projects increases and the speed at which people are wanting to build increases, which ends up calling for greater specialization. And now I don't think you could ever return to the point where the architect is the structural engineer, is the mechanical engineer is the person who can get up on the scaffolding and adjust a really tricky bit as it would have been in the Middle Ages. It wouldn't be possible to hold that much knowledge in your head because we build in such mo much more diverse ways now. Um, mm. So sort of in a nutshell, yeah. like, perhaps. I, I don't know if you agree, Paul. <laughs> Not completely. I understood. But alongside that, there's this escalating regulatory complexity which corresponds i think perhaps to the emergence of democratic will so we have this kind and and you mentioned grenfell at the beginning which is for me the crisis moment of for architecture in the last few few decades probably you know R ronan point did the same thing um but but it, but in a way this was more shocking for the start it was worse um yeah, so I, I was just kind of it, the, the legislative um, landscape in which architects operate has also become so complex that you kind of need specialists to deal with that side of it as well. Yes, I I, I agree. Um, well, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> I think also the legislation has grown as people are as the government 
and has slowly what well, governments across the world have slowly involved themselves more in the day to day and also of course architects are now involved in more everyday buildings than we were in history if you're going back to the middle ages and the early modern period architects and amateur architects and master crafts people that it tended to be very high status buildings the cathedrals the stately homes the palaces not exclusively but largely whereas now architects design housing they design bus stops they do, like it's our involvement with the daily lives of the majority of the population is much greater than it was in a lot of history and therefore sort of just for the safeguarding of everyone really it it makes sense that there's more legislation for those sorts of things and there's also sort of a a general loss of skills across the industry you don't get these apprenticeship traditions where they're passing down what you could argue is implicit legislation over the centuries in the masons guilds and things we don't have that inherited tradition anymore it's much more codified mm. the <clears throat> the um this thing paul that you mentioned at the beginning this idea of the professional i thought perhaps we should we should talk a little bit about that what does it mean to be firstly a professional and then to be an for the architect to be a professional what does this in 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 the kind of way that architects describe themselves the way the riba describes us it, um what does it mean I, I think for me this is this is the pertinent question of our times if we can if we consider ourselves a profession um and under the accepted norm that a profession has expertise has knowledge more than anybody else and you're trained and educated you 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 put that experience into place um i i think it's accepted for example in the same conversation you have uh, professions who are in the medical profession in in things like accounting in law those people have deep knowledge and deep experience and are able to advise and i think we as a profession uh, architects that's i should clarify I think we've somewhat, and picking up on some of the things that we were talking about just a few moments ago, we, we seem to be heading in the opposite direction. Our, our knowledge is becoming less um, by definition. Our uh, experience is less because it's becoming re really, I, I hesitate to use the word refined, but more narrowed into particular fields as opposed to a wider knowledge. So, I, Ambrose, in response to your question, I think the term expression is up is up for discussion at the moment I, I i don't wish to i'm not being alarmist there i i'm as as ellie knows i said the other evening i'm i'm an optimist about the future i think we have and to open up this part of the conversation a little bit more i think let, let's bring the word education into the conversation now because th this is where it all begins and if we start to talk about knowledge and the profession is determined and defined by its acquisition um, uh, um of knowledge i i would suggest that we have a very good opportunity to review the academic process and i'm sorry to say this has been generated by the tragedy of Grenfell and the ARB with its current architectural uh, education review and potential reforms, but it's it's not addressing the right subjects. And I, th I think too many people now are saying the same thing. A few people were saying it a number of years ago that architects don't know enough, that there's too much focus on studio or design or whatever one wants to call it, that other areas such as professionalism, ethics, management, the regulatory environment, and so on, the wider knowledge of what it means to become an architect, including being collaborative, working in a team, and so on. All of these themes, all of these subjects were identified, I would say, in the 70s by people like Arup. Ove Arup was very clearly um, stating that the architect's role is reducing that the architect was not so much aware of technology, was losing pace with technology, wasn't keeping up with new advances in technology and prefabrication and um, and precast uh, panelization and so on. So I, I think I think 
Come back to your point, Ambrose, about professionalism. I think it's very clear for me what we have to do at the moment. We're in a period of let's talk about it. Let's talk the schools and the profession should talk about what it means to be a professional. Mm-hmm. But this idea of a professional. I I, uh, I mean, the professional versus lay knowledge. So, I mean, something that, Ellie, you touched on a little bit. So I'm going to dance around a little bit here. This idea of most buildings not historically have not been made by craftspeople, you know, specialist craftspeople slash architects, however you want to describe them, but have been essentially vernacular. And it's quite interesting in your book, you note how, and this is noted frequently, how in Britain, most buildings don't need an architect involved in them. But on the continent, they do, and that's better. So in a way, on the continent, the architect as professional is embedded in the practices of everyday built environment production, much more than they are here. Here we have still got this kind of, I suppose you could call it some form of capitalist vernacular thing, you know, volume house builders just get to do any old stuff. Um, and, And you get Grenfell off the back of that, arguably. So I'm kind of interested in in this in this uh, issue around the profession because it, we have a sense feeling of what a professional is. It looks like someone who behaves professionally, but I still don't know what that means. Do you know what I mean? It's so 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 architects could lay claim to this this title of the profession simply because they can. It's a sort of claim you can make if someone says you're you know it, it, I, I'm, I'm finding it difficult to understand what what being more professional would look like does it mean knowing more about law does it mean knowing more about contracts does i mean i think if you look at to use paul's example doctors or lawyers you expect them to have a broad grasp of medicine or of law or whatever the subject is and to offer a sort of fairly dispassionate independent guidance based on a broad knowledge base, um, which is, I think, what we'd say, or what I would believe, and I think Paul probably agrees with me, what we'd say broadly what being professional is. And I think if architects are to continue to claim to be professional, which has been, again, arguably the big fight of our um, career for the last couple of centuries ever since the sort of late 1700s architects have been trying to group themselves with doctors and with lawyers rather than with builders and tradespeople I think if you're going to continue to claim that you need to keep the broad knowledge base and in our case because we're construction professionals it is a broad knowledge base of construction and I don't personally believe um, and my education was a little bit more recent than Paul's, um, but I know you're involved in education now, Paul. Um, I don't personally believe that architecture education as it stands gives you a broad enough knowledge base. I've certainly learned most of being an architect since I've been practicing. And of course, the danger with that is if you go and work somewhere that doesn't display best practice on a daily basis, you're going to pick up all sorts of bad habits and become a very poor architect with a very poor knowledge base simply because you ended up in the wrong part one placement. Um, And after six years, four or five, six years full-time at university, I don't really think that's good enough. It's not worth the money, is it? Well, I wouldn't like to say. Depending on what I do. (laughs) Well, I'm allowed to say this. I'm not in education. Both of you probably have to be much more circumspect. (laughs) No, not not at all. Let me me introduce another word here, Ambrose, and that's value. I I don't think we can have a conversation about the profession, the role of the architect, without also talking about value. Mm -hmm. And that, again, that, that, that comes from how we value ourselves as much as how we are valued by society. And that has that has certainly been eroded over the years. The the RIBA conducted a survey a few ge- few years ago. It's quoted in the book of of the client, and and many, let's say, established architectural construction clients don't know what we do. I mean, I'm generalising what why widely and wildly, but I think also um, in the schools from an early age. Um, uh, c- careers officers in schools, the general public, mostly don't really understand what an architect does and what our value 
is. And that's something, again, I think in the conversation that we've got to have as a profession over the next years, we have to really understand why that is, identify it and do something about it. Mm. I do remember talking to um, an architect who ran the part, a part three course at a university in um, in Scotland, where I was before. And uh, he was talking about how he had been employed. He had, he had taken a law degree after doing his architecture because he realized that in negotiations over large contracts, he was the only person in the room who didn't know what was going on mm. as the architect. Like that everybody was skipping around him. So he got a mm. law degree and then he became an expert witness. And, and, um, and I thought that that was really, that was really telling because, because it, te- it speaks volumes about the way that the, the, the public perceive us. And mm. I mean, you mentioned this at the beginning, um, Ellie, really, and it kind of, we have this weird thing about the, the promotion of the profession, which is either through glossy books on millionaires houses, <laughs> sort of a sort of irrelevance, um, or we have technical guides, but actually there's very little in between that. And then you've got, you know, academic, very d- d- dense academic stuff, which is which is valuable in its in its own space. But actually the sort of the what it is of architecture is l- largely hidden. And there's definitely an appetite for it outside of architecture circles. I mean, look at how popular Grand Designs has been as a TV program. Mm-hmm. All of that is about the process, isn't it? Um the process and, of architecture is fascinating. It goes wrong. Exactly. But the process is fascinating and dramatic and so interesting. And mm. everyone seems to want to pretend that we never have bad days or it just happens effortlessly because we're all such geniuses. But this, I mean, this obviously is, we all are. But <laughs> yeah. This is a really good point to explore a little bit, Ellie, because it's, it's a while since I've watched Grand Designs. But when I did, architects were rarely involved. They weren't the center of the program at all as the creator of, and of, of, a, of a design responding to a client's brief. It was always the client, the site, the budget, the builder and the host of the program walking around either sucking his teeth or concerned about delays and so on. And the architect often wasn't involved in the build at all. I mean, I might be wrong, but um, again, I, I just think the value of the architect didn't come through or certainly didn't in the programs I watched. No, no, they didn't. But I mean, then you have to ask the question, is it because the commissioning people at Channel 4 or whoever never thought maybe it'd be interesting to go and sit over the shoulder of the architect whilst they're having an argument with a structural engineer? Mm. Um, maybe they didn't know that's what happens. I, I mean, yeah. yeah. But, the, I mean, to go back to this idea of the professional, in the reading I've done previously, there's a big literature on the sort of professional versus lay epistemologies and knowledges. And this idea of the professional is that the professional is validated by the body that sits behind it, which is its knowledge base, which is authorized in a way by a meta body. In our case, it's the ARB and the RIBA. Who, But it's also this notion of capital T, the capital A architect and architecture as a, as a, as a discipline like law is a discipline or medicine is a discipline. And so when people employ an architect, they don't employ Eleanor or Paul or Ambrose. They employ the architect who is. And 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 I think perhaps where for me, where where our crisis, part of our crisis comes from, is that those bodies behind us are not seen as being as reliable as general medical counsel is or whatever the law one is called general law council right? um perhaps that um, perhaps what the, the knowledge that they're seen as holding is not seen as as important or as refined or as defined in some particular way well it, 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 i think you're making a very good point i i think the riba in my opinion and you know I have to respect the fact that they graciously published our book so and they were very supportive in in so doing but on on the other hand uh, I I I get I get so frustrated with the RIBA. I I think there's some excellent people there as individuals doing really good things, but as an institution, something seems to happen to them when they walk through the doors of 66 Portland Place, and that sort of cohesiveness 
that 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 value to use the word I use it seems seems to be dissipated and representing the profession they're very rarely in the press mm. um in political debates in economic debates in the economy talking about defending the profession arguing its cause i mean just one example i i would ambrose ellie i would ban i would stop all awards from now given by architects to architects and that includes I mean, not that I can do this, but but let me dream for a moment. I, w- I would stop the Pritzker, but if we if we're focusing on the institution and our representative works body, you works for the latest recipient of it. <laughs> I did, but I, I again, but that's about and and here I'm going to introduce another theme. I, I posted on LinkedIn a month or so back. Uh, the Pritzker has to change its 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 um, awarding criteria to not make it uh, given to a hero or an individual. Mm. Surely it has to go to a body of people called a practice and all of its collaborators and the clients and society at large. And that's my problem to bring it back to the ROBA, the institution of our profession. I, I just don't think, I, I think the relevance of awards given by architects to architects that the public does not understand has to has to be reviewed. And I would put a moratorium for a year or two on awards and start to think of how the profession awards and rewards uh, itself. There's also, just to pick up on your point about the RIBA in the press, I think the difficulty in architecture, because... The RIBA isn't a statutory body. It's essentially a voluntary membership organization whose role is to promote architecture, not architects. So fundamentally, it isn't really there to promote architects by themselves. Whether that's right or wrong is perhaps another discussion. Um, And then we've got the ARB that have very defined and limited statutory duties to protect the title of architect which as far as I'm aware, and I'm not an expert, isn't the case with either medicine or law. We both have sort of a lot of professional bodies and also to an extent none because the ARB there is there to protect the title and to define the education. The RIBA is there to promote architecture, um, but not necessarily the value of the architect or to kind of be the guardian of the knowledge base. We don't really have an institution that acts as the sort of like the general medical council does as far as i'm aware or or if that was ever the intention Mm. neither of them as you say seem to be fulfilling it now yeah the the, to to move this on a a little bit because we're all in lunch breaks and it's uh time is money and of the essence The, the this the the book documents this opening out i think you call it an opening out in the book this opening out of the professional of the profession, away from this idea of sole authorship, which is, I think, a fantasy anyway and never existed. But it's it's how we describe the past anyway. It's kind of useful to create avatars that we can hang stuff on um, towards this idea of partnering and collaboration. Um, And this has been at the heart of the diminishing of the status of the architect. It might be suggested. It can be suggested. It certainly can be described quite easily in that way. But the, the, the important question that comes off the back of that then, um, uh, which you you also uh, you also um, write about, is that who 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 then ultimately is the designer of the building? And then this comes back to this issue around education, where we train people to be sole authors. They go into practice and they are a fairly small cog in a very big machine. Um, so I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about this opening out, this this idea of the collaborative role and where the architect sits now within that. Let's let's go back to education. And you're and you're right. You're you're let's open up that as a discussion point in that we educate our young people in degree from from almost from day one mm-hmm. to work alone. I mean, in, in in what in what way is that ever correct? I'm I'm really quite open about this. I'm really quite critical about this. Uh, the education of an architect. Some schools do have collaborative teamwork, group work type projects. The defence 
in academia, as you're probably aware, Ambrose, is that it's not possible to assess an individual student's performance if they do group work. I, I just think this is nonsense, but but let's not let's not go there. I think that is an easily resolvable issue. Nor do we, and and I'm and now let's link society with collaborators with the teaching of architects, nor do we introduce um society particularly i'm overgeneralizing I, 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 but bear with me um into community projects in schools of architecture again there are perfectly good examples like sheffield the lsa and so on who do really good collaborative um, so, um society based projects nor do we involve um the education in education the roles of others engineers uh, of all and all other consultants and and then we have something called the unit system which is even within a particular school, within the unit itself, within the school, can be highly idiosyncratic, highly esoteric, and highly particular in its language. So it reinforces itself all the time. So to use the expression of opening out, we, we're actually shutting down thinking. School of architecture should be, I mean, education generally should be intellectual curiosity, opening out, investigation, not having a fear of failure, experimentation. That's what education should be about. But unfortunately, it's mostly closing down. So it's no wonder that when young professionals, students leave School of Architecture, year three, year five, and head off into their careers, they're not really thinking about collaborating. Often in practice, we used to engage year one students um, and they join us very fresh on day one, very excited to be in the studio and think they had something to prove. So they go into a corner and do a design on their own. And that's absolutely not what we wanted. We wanted them to be come and come into the practice, into the studio, join us as, as a team and work together as a team. And it took us, we had to undo that educational framework that they'd already been part of for three years of working solitarily on, a, on an individual project. Oh, entirely. I mean, delivering, designing and delivering a building is such an endlessly complicated process you cannot do it as an individual even an individual architect i i mean i tend to work on larger scale projects but it's always a meeting of minds and it's not just architectural minds you need engineering trained minds and specialist facade people or specialist sustainability people it depends on the project but you need a broad range of uh, people education specialisms experience in order to deliver a building so the collaboration is absolutely key. And I think a lot of the reports from the construction industry in the 90s were pointing that way, that actually the increasingly adversarial procurement routes, I mean, design and build done badly is a good example, that sort of set the architect and the builder against each other. Something like that is never going to be good for the building at the end, which is what we all claim we're invested in the whole team, design, construction, education, everyone needs to work together because it's just too complicated a field for individuals to think they you can't go into architecture thinking you're going to be the star architect and it's going to be that individual because the majority of buildings have got hundreds, if not thousands of people involved in them. And, and I was... <clears throat> I had the great privilege of being shown around a big building on site in, in central London by the architect Patrick Lynch um, recently, a project that his practice is working on. And um, now I worked in practice, but always on smaller things because, uh, you know, the smaller, more more regional architects. And it, it's like the looking at this building and the architect showing it around, and it was a design and build contract with a very good contract a great relationship apparently um really good client um really amazing site and a great design but the complexity was amazing i mean it was mind blowing and i mean i teach this subject and i was just sort of startled but also i have to say i was rather it was rather exciting and i think this is one of the 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 false uh, falsities that we promote is that mm -hmm. collaboration is a diminishment 
and actually working out that there's this team of people called the architects that are cent central to the coordination of this symphony of activity over many years. I think I think Patrick's project had taken him like over a decade to get to the point of nearly practical completion. I just thought it was that. I thought it was incredibly moving in a peculiar kind of way. And I, I think you're making a, good, a really good point about design and build as well, actually. One of, one of the... Perhaps you could explain design and build. Well, this, design and build is a form of procurement, a form of building a building whereby an architect, let, let's, let's keep it to the architect and the design team, are, are employed essentially by a client, a user possibly, or whoever um, is the client. And then mostly for reasons of managing and mitigating risk, at the point of uh, design development, we'll go out to tender and appoint a contractor to build the building, but to continue on with the design work. So not all of the design is complete. Often in such cases, an architect is novated. That term means that the architect moves their contractual responsibilities from the client to the contractor, and the contractor becomes the new client to complete the building. Ambrose, I, I, I would say that there's a des design and build is getting a bad press or had a bad press a number of years ago. And, and just to pick up on a few things Ellie was mentioning earlier, I, I try to bust that myth with my part three students and year three students to say that design and build is not all bad. It could be considered a really good way of collaborative working and importantly, respecting the contractor's input. And yes, they're engaged to build the building and it's a guaranteed price. It's a guaranteed timeline. So quality isn't always uppermost in their mind. But ultimately, it's about methodology of building, construction method, methodology and detailing. So I, I think you're right. You know, one, one can be super impressed with that work, way of working together as long as the design and build contractor and everybody in the team has the vision of, of an end goal. They share that vision. I think design and build could be an appropriate means to uh, to design. Well, to give a, a very real uh, life to design and, and construct a building. I've been mm. working on a, a large project on site for the last couple of years. And we've had several instances because we have a very good relationship with the contractor we're working with. We've been novated. Um, there's been several instances where they've looked at the drawings and gone, yeah, we can do it like this, but actually this is going to last better because we did this on the last project. We were always going back for defects for the next five years because stuff, stuff kept going wrong. We want to do it like this because we think it's going to be better. And because we had, we've got a great team at that construction company who really care about producing a good building as well they are doing it to the fixed time and they are doing it to the fixed budget but we've got a fantastic group of individuals who are also looking at the quality and i think that's the thing too, too often people are willing to believe oh well of course everyone's just trying to get all the profit out and i don't know why that would be the case because a lot of the people you deal with mm -hmm. at general contracting have worked through mm -hmm apprenticeships in building crafts themselves and have come out with a real respect for what they're doing and a real desire to see it done well. I mean, not mm -hmm. everyone, but then you can say the same with architects or with engineers. Not everyone is going to be. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's, I think that's really, that's really true. And, and it's a really good, I could talk for ages. I think this is really, really interesting subject. And obviously I do, I teach it. And I've spent years and years thinking about it and how to make it better. But I obviously spend most of my time thinking about education. And we've touched on education a number of times. I thought perhaps maybe we could finish by talking about where we go in the future. How, Ellie, for example, what would you like to see your part ones, which are no longer going to exist as far as I can see, um, which is going to do, it's going to put the industry into yeah, a death no, spiral. Yeah, maybe don't start on the ARB's like, suggested reform. Oh, bro, <laughs> stop it. <laughs> well, I mean, well, if you get rid of part ones, read, what, what if you read the full reforms, I don't know if they are getting rid of part anyway. ones. Certainly not the requirement to do an undergrad degree. Um, but anyway. <laughs> um, okay. 
Um, but where do we go from here? Where where do we where does where what would you like to see in incoming part ones, part twos? What would you like the skill set to be, and how do we get there through education? I and what is the role of practice? Some diversity of routes in and would be helpful. I think um, a greater alignment between profession and academia would be helpful. At the moment, you very much have to choose if you want to become a practicing architect or work in academia. I know there's a little bit with studio tutors and stuff where people shuttle back and forth, but the serious research that happens happens in an academic silo, usually, and I think that's not healthy. Um, though that's a shake-up to practice as well. But in terms of part ones and part twos coming in, I think a, a greater understanding and a greater appreciation for the skill of technical design and alignment of the competing requirements of briefs and contracts and building regulations alongside the wonderful conceptual side of things that they're so well versed in at the moment. I think too many people believe design is where you put the windows and don't realize that there's so much skilled design in marrying up all of the different competing standards and requirements and guidance and client brief and consultant input. There's a great deal of design in that that isn't arranging where the windows and doors go. Um, so I think an appreciation of that and also a, a greater willingness to be part of a team not that a lot of individuals aren't but there's a slight fear that if they go and ask someone a question they've failed because they don't already know the answer and when you start a new job or a new project you absolutely do not know the answer so asking not asking the question is failing but I, I don't I think a lot of people are, are scared to to admit to not knowing which is a pity mm. What about you, Paul? Um, I would uh, I would include more subjects in part one, if that's what we're calling it, the degree, should we say, open it up to both uh, more humanities subjects as well as the more scientific technical background. I would introduce ethics at a very early stage uh, to get people thinking about what is their ethical p position. I would... I mean, Ambrose, I, I read a lot of part three candidates' career appraisal essays that they write in advance of sitting their part three exams. I would say almost all of them uh, express frustration at their part two studies, their diploma, their master's uh, years, frustrated because they consider it more of the same. It's another two years going to a, a deeper level, yes, of, of design, but not much more. And I think they really do. Students really want more. So I would change the whole um, pattern and, and typology of, of part two. I would make it more um, research based, um, very particular to uh, students' interests at a deeper level, a deeper research level, not so uh, uh, following general attributes, general criteria and so on. Um, Ellie said something really quite quite key for me about failure. I, I, I goes back to what I said earlier. I, I would encourage more testing, laboratory experimentation in schools. And then and then again, I think you've both mentioned it as well. I abs having had a long career in practice, and now in academia, for me and the, and and to to draw a thread together of what we were talking earlier about the RIBA. I think the RIBA has a role to bring the profession, and that's practitioners as well as academia students and academics together there is a chasm in my opinion at the moment between what the those in practice are doing without little with little contact with students and i think we have to find ways of uh, just getting students jobs that practice has an important role in continuing to teach students that's it's all part of the whole um, i mean i use the term apprenticeship i'm not using it in a formal sense but the apprenticeship and the studying of of the acquisition of knowledge and experience. I think it's the role of practice cannot be underestimated. Really, really important. I'm going to finish with a kind of very controversial question. And it's one that I've been mulling recently because I got certain things to do in the master's course that I lead. And I was wondering, and I'm reading your book really brought this out for me. Maybe this is, wasn't, wasn't the intention, but is it, is, should architecture be taught in university at all? Is our central problem here 
that we've made an academic dis we've made a practical discipline and a technical discipline fundamentally an academic esoteric discipline by putting it in universities and what needs to happen is to draw it back out of that space and into the world of sociology uh which is to say society um ethics uh which used to be called morality um and so on and so forth of technology which is to say craft and making is the problem and and you also document through the book that this position of architecture within education has shifted and shifted and shifted and shifted and the ARB about to do it again. Maybe there's a bigger change that's required that just extracts it from that that separate that separate realm. I, th I think the short answer to that is yes. If I've if I've understood the question correctly, Ambrose, there 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 are two. The, the pathway to become an architect is far too narrow. Yeah. that's that's really super clear um and i it comes out of the 58 oxford conference when uh architecture as a profession was formalized in terms of academic pathways the what the one two three pathway and i think we really do have to open that up uh, that's really for me fundamental to the future role of the architect and um you know not everything is taught it can't be taught in university it, it is about experience so Let's let's put people into young people into practices and and embrace other roles on their route to uh, to becoming an architect. I'd agree with the caveat uh -huh. that if we're moving education further into practice, practices also need to be prepared to engage with that and to upskill, because one of the reasons it moved towards universities was the huge disparities in education that architects were getting depending on who they were working for. Um, so in order to have that consistent mm -hmm. education across the field, there's probably always going to be a role for universities. Similarly to Paul, I wonder if the balance needs to shift a bit though towards practice. Excellent. Good point to finish on. Thank you very, very much, Eleanor. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you. Thank you, Ambrose. To misquote Chipperfield, the difference between a good and bad architecture podcast is the time you spend on it. This one took ages. Thanks to Eleanor and Paul for joining me and the great chat. Thanks to Reba for the book. See the podcast description for links to it, its authors, and reviews. And thanks for listening. Cheers. <laughs>